welcome to another thrilling edition of the Ron Line Report. With us today is somebody I've known for quite some time. Can't believe I didn't even think to interview him until he's about to hopefully win another contest here in a few days. This is IFBB Pro Stan McQuay. Stan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Ron. It's been quite a while since actually we've done any type of interview. I, I, I'm trying to think when the last time we did something together. 1984. No, it was probably... <laughs> Probably in the early 2000s or so? No, late 90s? Maybe so. no, yeah, probably late 90s. Right? It's been a while. So yeah. It's been I want to get into a little bit of your history because a lot of these younger cats don't know all about you. Uh, first thing people say is, what is Stan's ethnicity? What, what the heck are you, Stan? <laughs> yeah, my mother's uh, Japanese and my father's Irish. So I was born in Japan in a military base, yeah. but I you know, pretty much moved out here. You know, I was very young. We lived in Illinois um, for the first maybe uh, seven years of my life. Yeah. And you grew up in Van Nuys, California, which is the Valley, yes? That's the Valley, yes. Famous for skateboarding and adult film, as far as I'm concerned. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. You're right. <laughs> and also, for those who don't know the, the greater L.A. area, kind of a rough, rough area, Van Nuys. A lot of gang activity, a lot of crime, violence. Uh, so, you know, what was it like growing up around all that? First question. Well, I didn't really know any different, man. So to me, you know, you know, we, we grew up in the hood, you know, like literally it was like, um, you know, right in the heart of the valley, but parts of the valley are known for, you know, having a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a gang territory things going on. So, you know, um, it's funny growing up. I was just telling this story to a friend of mine growing up and I remember, you know, the uh, neighbors of ours in our apartment building complex invited me over. And so they would take me to the park and stuff like that in their car. And I remember getting in the car and it was a, it was like a 64 Impala. And I remember going down the street in the back of this thing. And it was the first memory I have of being in someone else's car. And the car started bouncing up and down and going down the street. It was, I'll never forget, man, because I thought it was like a ride, you know. And that's all, that's the type of memories I have is growing, growing up with the Vatos, you know. Yeah. So I, I know you were into a lot of things like martial arts, football and everything. Uh, you know, did you get caught up in any of that as a kid yourself? Uh being in that area with all those people? Yeah, you know, I grew up in the neighborhood, and so it was kind of like, um, you know, I, it's what I gravitated to. So, you know, when I when I went to high school, I went to another high school that was very similar, and you know, I don't know, it just uh, I, I kind of gravitated to that, got in a lot of fights. I knew how to fight, so just like, I don't know, it just, <laughs> they pulled me in, I pulled myself into that type, type of uh, uh, scenery, you know? So, you know, I'm sure a lot of the kids you were hanging out with probably not even alive some of them are there a lot of them i'm sure are dead or in jail so how are you not dead or in jail at this point what happened with you that turned everything around oh man i, I say it's a lot of things though know, for one I'm, I'm very blessed and very lucky to not be in the wrong place at the wrong time you know don't get me wrong I, i've been in some really bad situations but you know like you know i guess one of the things that kind of set me straight was my best friend in high school you know he's who's serving he was serving 25 years who is now hitting the 25 year mark uh, we'll be getting out, but you know, you know, he was in there for murder, and it was just one of those nights where, you know, I I, I felt like I was supposed to be there. I, I you know normally I would be there, but I just wasn't that night, and it was crazy. You know, a big wow. shootout, and he ends up killing someone. You know, that would have been me, or that would have been me right there with him. So you know, it was a culmination of uh, quite a few things happening at that time. Of you know, guys, friends of mine is dying and, and and going to jail for long periods of time, and it's just. You know, there's got to be a wake-up call at some point, and that was just one of them right there. It's like, what am I doing this for? Why doing? You know, I'm I spend the rest of my life in jail for shooting someone over some stupid words, you know, or yeah. territory that on I territory that I don't even know nothing about. You know, it's yeah. not even my territory. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, we were talking a couple days ago. Full disclosure, everybody. This is the second time we've done this interview. Had a <laughs> problem that was actually beyond beyond my control. It was the uh, the software. Anyway. Stan reminded me that we actually worked for the same company for a brief time. Uh, in the 90s, I worked for American Sports Network. A guy named Lou Zwick was the uh, owner of the company. Rosemead, California. Uh, we did the American Muscle Show on ESPN. We produced uh, the Muscle Mania Contest, Fitness America pageant. Muscle Mania, Stan ended up winning that I don't know how many times. But you actually started out interning for that company when you were real young, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, right as I was getting ready for uh, one of the competitions, yeah, I was working there helping with the uh, event coordinating and whatnot. Yeah. So, you know, you were bodybuilding uh, in the early 20s. You started competing. At, how quickly did you know that this was something that you could be good at? You, could, you were better than the average guy who tried it. 
Well, I'm still trying to figure that out. I never really learned that yet, you know. I think that's why I've been that's why I've been doing this for twenty something years. Is uh, I'm still trying to look for that gratification. Do, do I fit the mold yet? Yeah. You know, I I I think I told this story the other day is you know I used to get so pissed off at guys like Sean Ray who would comment on you know on my placings. Yeah, Stan McQuay looks really good, but just uh you know really athletic and kind of sporty looking. He needs more of this and that. You know, I was like yeah. they used to piss me off so bad. When am I gonna get considered a bodybuilder ever? So he's like, he's real athletic looking. Wow. Um, so what was that, the question? I'm sorry. Hold on, Sean. Apologize to this guy when you see him. How dare you? Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> but you yeah. actually did very well. Uh, you know, I know you did the, the natural circuit for a while. You excelled muscle mania in the world. You won, you won some big titles there, but then you went on to NPC. By 2002, you were the middleweight USA champ. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Then 03 and 04, th- national middleweights second place and at that time you had to win your class still it wasn't second place like it is now when you got your pro card finally got your pro card 2006 moved up to the light heavyweight class at the nationals so 2006 you find yourself with ifbb pro card but this was just before a couple of years before there was a 202 which is now the 212 division so what were you thinking here here i am 100 what 90 pounds uh, and there's there's really no options other than at that time you would have been competing against Jay Cutler, Ronnie Coleman. Uh, I think like Marcus Rule was still around at that time. It a, yeah, it's still land of the giants. So <laughs> what were you thinking? What were you, what was your next move? Um, my next move had already made. I already had made made my decision. I got my pro card 2006, and I was just gonna you know run some businesses, and I was done with bodybuilding. You know, I felt like you know I hit the pinnacle for you know being realistic. You know, I really I didn't really have any urge to get on stage to place last. You know, I mean you gotta look at your odds and and be realistic with it. So you know I wasn't doing anything. I was working, partying, living the life. And um, it wasn't until the inception of the 202 class um, that I had, you know, started to get some more interest in it. And I said, you know what, I'm already working on it. I think it looked pretty good. You know, I, I could do pretty well in this, you know, considering at the time the parameters were sub- supposed to be based on aesthetics and symmetry and, and not the big muscle, the, not the, uh, the mass monsters. And, uh, no, that's essentially kind of how it started out. You know, I think the first year... Um, what was his name? Sylvia Samuel won won a two hundred five show, and I don't recall who else won. But you know, when I saw that, I go, "Hey, now that that's more interesting to me because you know Sylvia Samuel is still to this day has one of the best physiques I've seen." Um, so you know, I said, "Screw it, let's, let's do it." So it took me a full three years, really, because two thousand six is when I turned pro. I didn't compete again until two thousand nine for my pro debut. Wow. At that time, it was still 202. I don't think it shifted to 212 till like uh, 2011, maybe, I want to say. I think that sounds about right, yeah. yeah. Hey, you know, I, I saw you in your your first couple shows as a 212, and, uh, you know, as as we were saying the other day, that class got bigger, shorter and thicker very, very quickly. Within, like, a couple of years, uh, you know, guys like David Henry, Jose Raymond, Flex Lewis, Eduardo Correa. But, you know, I'm looking at your record. Considering you weren't like a mass monster, you've always had more of a classic symmetrical physique. You did pretty well as a 212. You won three shows, uh, 2009 Jacksonville Pro, 2010 Detroit Pro, 2011 Sacramento Pro. So, I mean, was there hope for you that even though you weren't a little fire plug, you did have this really incredible shape, proportion, symmetry, condition, that you would be able to hold your own in that division for, you know, as long as you wanted? Well, you know, after I won my pro debut, I, I, I kind of like, it really takes a lot of the ease off your mind thinking, do I have what it takes to, you know, be a pro, uh, you know, in, in, even though I'm still not even close to the 202 weight cutoff, I, I think my pro debut, I was only 192, so I still gave up 10 pounds, so, you know, all the insecurities as a, as a bodybuilder that we all have, am I big enough, uh, do I have what it takes, so from that point, you know, it, it gave me a little motivation knowing that I could still grow, a little, you know, 10 pounds in, in, in this division. So I kept at it, you know, and then it wasn't until, like you said, 2011 when they decided to move the weight class up from a 202 to a 212. I mean, 10 pounds on, a, on my body frame and my height is, is a massive amount, you know. So this is when I said, you know what, it, it was, it was kind of like a goal of mine to, you know, let's really try to get on stage and see how big we can get. 
And so, you know, I, I battled it out in the 212 division. I, I won one show, but, you know, as I got on stage and each time I, I would see pictures, I just was not happy. I was actually pretty disgusted with how I, how I felt like I had ruined my body and my shape and my aesthetics by, you know, trying to be so big and not playing my game, you know. Yeah, I'm curious because you said that the other day, and you know, did other people comment on that, or was that just the way you felt? I think a huge part of it was how I felt because that's the most important. You know, when you know the pictures would come out on MD, and and, and I would see him, and I would just be embarrassed. I wouldn't even want to show people because I that's just not me. You know what I mean? Even though I won, I mean, I was the best day on that best guy on that on that day. I just I was embarrassed of it. I had big waist, and you know, my arms are still small, and it just. I just didn't look good, you know, so, yeah, I just started to get turned off by it again because, you know, I'm winning shows looking like this and that, that, I don't even feel comfortable. So that was, your last 212 show was 2011, am I right? Yeah, Sacramento, I believe it was, yes. So you basically yeah. re retired after that, right? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Until, until Classic came around. Yeah, until Classic came around, I wasn't, well, it was only like, yeah, yeah, you're right, I was, yeah. I was, wasn't doing anything, I'd just been training. So, yeah, let's let's go to that. 2016, early last year, they announced this new division that's going to be uh, more geared toward aesthetics, shape, proportion, symmetry, presentation. It's not supposed to be about just raw mass and, you know, if you show up with a big gut, forget it, you're, you're out of here. So, you know, uh, when I talked to Danny Hester a few weeks ago, I thought he would be very excited when he heard about this new division. He said, no, I, I was really it's more skeptical than anything else. Uh, the things he had issues with was he saw that there was only uh, like four or five poses. He didn't get to hit all the poses you did as a bodybuilder. And like yourself, he's been a bodybuilder for well over 20 years. You didn't get to wear trunks. You have to wear these like bike shorts things. So he was pretty hesitant about it. And he wouldn't have even done that first show. I think he basically followed you into that first show, the one in L.A. But when that announcement came and you heard about this division, what were your thoughts? Were you thinking, I don't know about this, or were you thinking, this sounds pretty cool? To me, right off the bat, it sounded pretty cool. I just didn't want to be the guinea pig for it, you know, because there really was no stipulations of what really they were looking for. And then what really was kind of a turnoff was looking at the, the weight parameters that they were, they were slapping on us, you know, from the start. I mean, I think for, I don't know what it's for Danny, but for me, it was uh, 175 pounds. Uh, I mean, I, I turned pro at a light, as a light heavy in 2006, so the last time I was 175, you know, 2002, I won USA, 2003, 2004, I was runner-up, and I, I, I killed myself to be 176 and a quarter, yeah. and that was yeah. well over 10 years ago, so in, in competing as an Olympian, you know, being on stage in like 205, I just thought, you know, it was a lot of work, I don't know if I really want to go through that, but I also, you know, I told myself, you know, I'm already kind of done with bodybuilding, and I told myself my walk-around weight ideally would be like 180, you know, not worry about, you know, competing. So I'm going to use this as a tool to get myself comfortable at the smaller weight. At least I'll be ripped, you know, instead of just shrinking into nothing, you know. Yeah. So I just kind of said, I talked Danny into it, and I said, let's just give it a shot, man. There's no other guys doing it, and, uh, you, know, we, you know, we can kind of set the bar on this. So and that's pretty much what we did. So after the first couple shows, you know, we're, still, we're still in the early stages of this division, obviously. Uh, when did they raise, did they raise the limit after the first season or was it actually during the first season they raised your limit again? It was uh, it's after, the, after the Olympia, so after the first season they gave us another five pounds. So what's your max weight you're allowed to be now? So now I went from 175, so now it's uh, 180. Well, they gave you five pounds, okay. I mean, it's yeah. not a lot, but that's not bad. It's a little better. It's better. Yeah, it's better. Um, yeah, the one thing I talked about with Danny that I found was interesting was uh, right out the box, the guys who were doing really well were bodybuilders, which to me, this is bodybuilding anyway. I, I believe eventually they're going to move to the regular trunks with, you know, a little wider waist uh, than not the little, you know, G-strings that the open yeah. guys wear. But, you know, I, I, it made sense to me that bodybuilders and especially guys like yourself and Danny who have all this seasoned muscle would be pretty dominant from the start, and you were. Did you have a good feeling going into that Olympia last year that, that it was going to be a, a good show for you? Um, you know, I, I felt good. I thought my conditioning was probably the best it's been. But still, making that 175 cut was just a lot of work on my body. And I just kind of felt like I looked wore out. You know, when I look at the muscles, 
it really depleted and I really struggled to get that weight down. Um, so, you know, I felt, I felt confident with my conditioning, but again, I just was a little bit too thin and a little too flat. And then having, you know, issues with my tattoo was, uh, you know, something that we didn't foresee from the start on this show. So I went in this competition, you know, uh, feeling really confident, but after the cover up that I had, we had, uh, used, you know, I knew that it pushed me out of the top five for sure. So which tattoo are we talking about? Do you have a big back piece? Is that what you're trying to cover up? Yeah. I have a huge uh, back piece back here. It's a, it's a dragon. Oh, yeah. So my whole back. So, you know, um, I competed in the three shows. Uh, the very first – actually, I competed in the Arnold Classic without it covered up. And, uh, you know, I took a seventh. You know, I was just – I just uh, you know, it was a lot of other things. That's the Arnold, you know. Yeah. So I did the first Classic without the cover up, and I took third. I didn't like the way it looked. So we went to Utah. I used a cover-up for the first time in my career and actually won the show. I beat Darren Charles at that one. And, um, you know, I thought it looked good. So I thought maybe we can improve on the cover-up. So we went to the Olympia from there. Yeah. We tried to mix the, mix the colors, you know, use some uh, special uh, mix from a, a makeup artist. And we didn't anticipate, you know, those lights, the stage lights, get, you know, uh, reflecting off of that. And it was just a horrible backfire. So, you know, I shot myself in the foot on that one. So... Um, this year, we you know we won't make that mistake again. Plus, they added five pounds on my body. I, I learned a lot more of how to control my weight and and still be able to grow into the show. So, you know, this year I don't feel like when I look in the mirror, I look all flat and depleted. I feel pretty damn good. Cool. So you trained for a few years to be a two twelve or two oh two, and then a two twelve pro. Then this right. this division comes along, and it's it's supposedly it's different ideals, different uh, parameters. How did you go about? revamping your training style, your nutrition, various things so your physique would fit more into the mold of what they're supposed to be looking for in classic physique. Yeah, well, so, you know, classic, you know, bodybuilding, classic physique, in the end, it's, you know, we all, we're all preparing for these shows the same. You know, we all eat the same foods, whether you're an open guy, 212, or a classic, or even a men's physique. We all do the same training for the most part. We all bust our ass cardio, same gear protocol, same supplements. The difference being, you know, what this new division is supposed to be, uh, about is is the posing as well. So you know, focus a lot more on you know uh, composure, how you look on stage. And now I, I, at this point in my career, because of the amount of muscle I have, I can afford to concentrate a lot more on the aesthetic parts of my physique, as opposed to just ch constantly trying to get big. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know that comes with time. Obviously, you know, 20, 20 years of competing, thirty years of lifting. You know, I'm able to 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 do that now because I put the work, the hard work in to build the base. You know, but but really, what was the difference? You know, the biggest difference even between the Olympia and now was focusing a lot more on on my midsection, which was still kind of inflamed and, and a little bit big from being a 212 guy. So you know, uh, uh, really trying to clean that up, getting inflammation down by in introducing a lot more supplements and products that we've been experimenting this year. Uh, my training is different, whereas I focus a lot more on core, a lot more on transverse muscles uh, uh, to control that midsection better. So you know, a lot of these things are going to be implemented to affect how I look on stage. That's the kind of way your training, our training has evolved. Well, it's interesting you say all that because, you know, these guts that a lot of guys get, and, you know, I've, I've got one myself a little bit, sure. You know, the feeling is that they're irreversible. Once you got a gut, that's it. You're screwed. It's, you got that for the rest of your life. I, you never had a, what I consider a gut. I mean, I saw, when you're talking about you had a gut, I, believe me, that's, that's nothing. But still, you say you've been able to actually reduce it significantly from where it was at, at its biggest? Yes, correct. So, you know, yeah, I know I didn't really have, you know, that, that protruding gut, but, you know, considering what I came from and how I competed all the time to, you know, I start seeing pictures and, and my stomach is not where it should be. I'm not, I don't have good control of it. Or, you know, how am I going to be at, you know, at 3% in my waist, you know, waist is all, waistline is like at 32. My gut looks like it's protruding at certain times, you know, those things need to be controlled, you know. Now, can you make your waist smaller? You can make your waist smaller, you know, by by longer duration of diet because, you know, you have, we all have visceral fat around those organs that really can, you know, be constantly worked on. Controlling the midsection, you know, uh, through core and transverse. And then, you know, we're really working on these particular supplements that I was talking about, you know. There's a lot of things out there that, that, are, that I've implemented to this program that I've studied. I've, uh, you know, worked with other uh, nutritionists to really try to nail some of these important factors that help me bring my waist down. Now, what are those things, you know? 
I'll be happy to share some of those things. You know, you can contact me on my website, you know, and, uh, you know, we'll, I'll help you with those. What is that website everybody wants to know? Yeah, so right now, like, my main, my main focus right now is my uh, online training company, which is physiqueinc.net. Yep. And there we do, we do online coaching, nutrition, training, uh, gear protocols, whatever you need, you know. But uh, a company that I'm also working with is prosarms1.com. So prosarms1, obviously, in the name, we deal with SARMs, but there's also the injectable aminos, which I, I, I kind of told you a little bit about before. And injectable aminos, we're talking about like a, we'll, we'll use a fat burn combo as an example. So we use a L-carnitine in an injectable form. So you're going to get 99% absorption into your bloodstream as opposed to you know, taking sublingually or a, a vitamin or a pill, which, you know, many times you only get 20% absorption. So, and you're going to pay a little bit more even. So, you know, these are injectable aminos. You take these things right before, you know, you're going to do any cardio and it makes your cardio sessions a lot more efficient. Uh, you're going to burn a lot more fat in a short period of time and you're more bang for your buck. You know, you're going to get, you know, 100% absorption damn near of a product that, you, you know, you're paying, paying for. So you got things, we got things like L-carnitine, uh, Yohimbi, you know, arginine for pre-workout, you know, carnosine. So all these things that have been studied and proven to work for on um, bodybuilders and I've implemented a lot of that stuff into my program this year and it's helped me tremendously. And, you know, I, I, of course, genetics plays a huge role in taking care of your body, but a lot of these things are also anti-aging drugs. So people ask me, how are you able to, you know, train and do all these things at your age? This is a big part, man. This helps, you know, with anti-inflammation. We have things like glutathione, uh, CoQ10 injectables. So all these things, you know, if you really do some studying, you got, you know, you got to evolve the mind, especially as a bodybuilder, if you want to have some longevity and you got to like expand your horizon and learn about these things as well, because there's many products out in the market that, you know, that are available to help. You stay younger, stay fit, keep inflammation away, and, and even the gut stuff that I'm talking about. You know, I don't think everybody realizes, just uh, looking at you, I don't think maybe people would guess. You're turning 44 years old next month. You know? Yeah, 44, yeah. I don't yep. know, it's just a crappy monitor I have, but I can't find like a line on your face anyway. <laughs> So. Well, I got lines, man. You know, I, I'm a week out of a show, so I, I look pretty jacked up right now, in my opinion. But yeah, considering that uh, I'm getting ready for a show, yeah, I think I still look kind of young. <laughs> uh, talk about diet. You're uh, you've been on the keto diet for over a year straight now. Is that correct? Yeah. So I, I've been following keto diet now, not full 100% keto. Uh, obviously, I've gone off at times, you know, for a week or two at a time, and, and experimenting with. You know, putting carbs back in and whatnot, but yeah, for the most part, for the past over a year, uh, yeah, I've been experimenting with the keto diet. So after all those years of you know standard bodybuilding diet with plenty of carbs interspersed in it, how do you how do you look? How do you feel differently on keto? How do you perform? How do you look? I mean, what's what's changed about the way you look and feel? I'm just curious. Well, just to start off, you know, keto has been around for a long time. You know, I remember back in the 90s, uh, guys like uh, uh, Palumbo were really big on, on keto and, and not, many, not many other guys. And, and our views back then were, well, keto is good if you're like a really big fat guy or really huge that really needs to get weight off. And if you're a smaller frame that's really ripped, keto is definitely not the way to go. And, you know, that, those beliefs, they kind of got to like reverse your way of thinking and, and, and trust in somebody. And, of course, when you're on a keto diet, you're going to lose the most weight right off the bat because there are no carbohydrates to hold water and, and whatnot. And, and essentially that's what you're losing is just water weight. People freak out all the time because they'll lose 10 pounds in the first two or three weeks. And they go, oh, I'm losing way too fast. Yeah. And I tell clients all the time, if it came off that easy, it was supposed to come off. We need to get it off eventually, whether it's in the first two weeks or five or six weeks later, you know. So keto, keto is good for getting in shape quick. Now, for someone like me who's not a big eater, yeah. uh, I don't have a big appetite, never have. So being a 212 guy was, was an absolute struggle for me because the amount of eating I was doing was just a lot of work, you know. Mm. And now being being on a keto diet and having to try and lose weight and not having a big appetite anyways, eating these really small meals, small amounts of protein with lots of vegetables uh, has been a blessing in disguise for me. I, I like I like feeling like I'm hungry a little bit all the time instead of like, God, I got to eat again. Yeah. I actually, you know, being on keto really, uh, you know, made me enjoy vegetables and foods I never liked before a lot more. You're appreciative of, of certain foods. So, you know, again, keto has been great. Um, as far as conditioning goes, I think uh, I'll be, I will be, and even last year I was at my, my best conditioning, not just because of the supplements I just talked about, but like, you know, you, obviously your diet is the most important. And for someone like me, uh, uh, being on keto, I got really grainy, really dense muscle. My pumps when I work out are still amazing. Uh, zero diuretics, not even herbal mm -hmm. diuretics. Don't have to do anything 
when getting ready for these shows because there's no water that carbohydrates are holding on to because I don't use carbs. I use fats. And when you really use fats, there's barely any water that gets held on as like what carbohydrates do. Hmm. So it, again, it's been, it's been a, 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 quite an interesting journey, you know, um, you know, implementing different phases of keto. We're doing uh, fat cycling, uh, you know, doing like a keto, hybrid keto where we will implement carbs here and there. But I mean, for the most part, keto, that's what I'm about right now. Hmm. Okay. It's definitely working for you. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, there's a lot of guys out there who are personal trainers. And the dream for any personal trainer, I, I did a little bit of it myself back in the day, is to be a celebrity personal trainer. And you have, <laughs> you have actually had the honor of working with some pretty big names. Uh, way back in the day, I met you training Dr. Dre up in that Chatsworth gym. And you have also trained Vin Diesel, Gerard Butler, and George St. Pierre, the fighter. Correct. So, oh, yeah. Uh, first of all, how did you how did you get into training celebrities? Well, you know, I, I, again, just uh, being in the right place, right time, being blessed. You know, living in, in L.A., you know, there's opportunities for anything and everything. You know, and um, you know, I, I think it's a little of me being a uh, uh, visible bodybuilder in the magazines and on TV. So a lot of these people start to know me where I'm at. Being in the L.A. market, there's a lot of people. Uh, staying in shape all year round, and you're walking billboard for yourself, and then and really just getting off your ass and trying to hustle some of these guys, you know, and, and let them know that that this is what you do. So those th uh, those few things right off the bat were were things that kept me driven to you know expand my business. But it's also when I say being in the right place and the right time, it helps that my two best friends are the biggest stuntmen in the business. One being the Rock's stunt double, and the other one being Vin Diesel. So networking networking at its finest, right there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that's my next question is, I'm sure some celebrities are really into training. Uh, like we talked about The Rock. That's a guy that's, he's basically a bodybuilder. You know, he was a pro wrestler. He was a standout college football player. So that's a guy training is part of his life. But I imagine some of these people you work with, it's not their life. And do they only want you to train them for a movie role? And then after that, they go back to like being a regular guy? Yeah, you know, I would say probably 80% mm -hmm. of the guys that are, let's say, celebrities that I'm getting ready um, or that I'm training, they're getting ready for a role. You know, this is not like lifestyle stuff. With the exception of, uh, let's say, Dr. Dre, obviously he wanted to revamp his look, but he still lives a healthy lifestyle now. He wanted to really learn everything, whereas opposed to, uh, I, won't, I won't say who, but, you know, a few of these actors. You know, I'll use an example. An actor that I did not train would be uh, the, the Wolverine or Logan, which was, um, Hugh Jack. what's his name again? Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman, there you go. Hugh Jackman got ready for that role. I think he started like 160 some pounds and got just got jacked for that role. And he ripped. Everyone saw how he looked. And then immediately after, got ready for Lay Miz, Miserable, and he had to lose all of that weight. So you know, whatever the role is that he, you know, he he's he gets into it. You know, I have some of these guys where, you know, they'll come at me and say, in like four or five weeks, I have a shirt off scene. You know, I need to be ripped, and they're fat as hell. I'm like, oh my god, here we go. You know. That's how they, and they don't even want to be there. They don't want to do it. So it's like double whammy. And then the pressure of having, you know, your guy who's the main, main, major star on the screen, you know, hire, spending all his money on a trainer that's supposed to be the top trainer out here, and then they got to get on the screen. He's still fat. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, the challenge I think uh, any, anyone who's a trainer would, would relate to is you can do everything with these guys in the gym for an hour, two hours every day maybe, but they still – they're on their own the rest of the day to eat or drink whatever the hell they want to eat or drink. So have you had issues where a lot of these people just really won't, you know, follow the diet supplementation program? Like oh my God. Supposed to? Yeah. You know, I had one actor who, you know, he had a deadline, an absolute deadline. And, uh, you know, in the script, he had to have his shirt off, clothes off, a couple of nude scenes and whatnot. And, um, you know, it was really important that he looked good because he was not in shape, you know, and, um, you know, it, it didn't matter what I told him, I wrote the diet out, I, I gave him supplements, whatever, it just wasn't changing. So I said, all right, I got to take the matter in my own hands. So I literally was doing his grocery shopping. I would go to his fridge, pack his stuff, write the menu like he was like a baby, you know? <laughs> and then I would, it was really like irritating that when I would go back a few days later and check in the fridge, none of that stuff was even touched, <laughs> wasn't even moved. I go, wow. what have you been doing? Like you come and train with me, what do you do? What are you eating? And 
and, and at least he's honest. It's like, yeah, I mean, Coronas and, and nachos, it's so hard to get away from that stuff. And it's like, geez, man. You know, so, yeah, there's there's only so much you can really do. And this this was me going to the house, buying the groceries, and, you know, they still don't do it. So, you know, when when you say guys want to train celebrities, yeah, it, it's cool. It's, it's absolutely awesome to have that on the resume. But in reality, you know, you're, you're training people that don't even want to be there. You know, right. usually when you're a regular trainer, they're, they're hiring you because they want to see a change, and, and they're willing to put the effort in. But a lot of these actors... Yeah. Uh, they're, they're only doing it because they're getting a paycheck, and they really—they're just really lazy for the most part. <laughs> I can corroborate yeah. that. I worked yeah. with a, a couple, and I'm—they weren't as big names as the names you're dropping, but similar situation. One actually just just dropped out the face of the earth. I even—I don't even know if he ended up doing the movie that he was supposed to do. But anyway, <laughs> back to you, and uh, let's get back to the classic physique and bodybuilding and all that good stuff. So we are now five days out from Chicago Pro where you're one of the definite favorites for the Classic Physique division at that show. How did you go about picking this particular show? Well, unfortunately, I didn't really pick this show on my own. It was kind of like, you know, I, I don't know, I was thinking after the Olympia, you know, I was really working a lot. You know, I have three kids, so I was really busy, and, and I have a lot, of, a lot of clients that are competing for shows. So I didn't really take the time out and sit down and look at the, the rest of the schedule for the year. Last year for 2016, there was a lot of classic shows. I mean, way more than enough. And, uh, you know, I, I think I just anticipated there was going to be a lot of shows. So when I actually decided to sit down and look, I realized there was only like three shows left in the year that I can qualify. That gave me the, a lot amount of time for me to get ready for a show. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I, I had to decide. Was it going to be New York, uh, uh, Toronto, Chicago, or Vancouver? So I decided I haven't done Chicago. I know that's a, it's a big city. Uh, uh, um, Tim Gardner is, is a pr production uh, guy on that. Those really good shows, big shows. And I said I want I want to be in a big show. I already did New York Pro before, and uh, my teammate Brian Ainsley was going to be doing that. So we decided you do that. I'm going to do Chicago, and that's where we are. Yeah, cool. Yeah, Brian. Uh, I saw him win New York, and wow, I was impressed. I knew who he was already, but I tell you, the West Coast is killing it for class of physique right now. But <laughs> between you, yeah. Danny, and Brian, it's it's, it's right. It's, it's frightening. You guys are pretty dominant. Uh, how old are your kids again? Yeah, I have three. So my daughter is uh, she's thirteen. My son Kai is six, and my son Zen is four. Okay, so they're all at a fairly young age where you know you want to be around and doing things with them. And we talked about this the other day. Is it you know is it tough? Is it challenging for you to try to go through all this contest prep and still try to be the kind of dad that you'd like to be? Oh, one thousand percent. So you got to remember. Uh, the classic physique uh, started last year, uh, so my the first show was in March of last year. Okay, so I started getting ready for that show about four months before. So my point is, since 2014 and a half, 2015, I've been really focusing on, on just training and, and living 100% bodybuilder lifestyle. So you know, when your kids want to come up to you and they want to go ride the bike and they want to do all these things, and you know, days like this when it's 110 out, you know, like. <laughs> You know, the first few, several months, I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're going to have to hold off on that and, or have your know, mom take you or whatever. But, you know, after, it's, we're going on, you know, almost two years of this now. So, you know, yeah, man, I, I started to feel really guilty. You know, I don't want to be that guy that's, you know, completely capable of doing these things. You know, I'm dead tired and, and you know, enjoying things with my kids, you know, because they grow up so fast. So that this has been, a, you know, a, a pressure of mine, meaning, you know, I put in 20 years. Uh, now it's time for my kids, and you know I, I, I've done everything. So you know I'm really taking this year, and we're going to really enjoy whatever happens at the end of the year. But for the most part, you know my goal right now is to make the Olympia. My ultimate goal for for my career would be to place on that podium um, in the finals. So if, if whether that's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever, you know I'm content with being on the final stage, and that would cap off an amazing career in in my eyes. So this this year could be it for you. It probably is going to be it for you. Uh, I, I'd like to say, yeah, you know, obviously I, I, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot and, you know, I know every bodybuilder says it, but, you know, we got to be real. I mean, it, it, like I just told you, if these things happen the way they do, mm -hmm. I'm done. Because, I mean, that's, I, I totally, totally feel what you're saying, especially with the young kids and everything. But at the same time, if I was in your shoes, I'd be thinking, yeah, but this new division just started. I'm really kind of doing really well in it. And. You know, even though you're almost 44, it seems like you're holding up really well. I don't see any, like, crazy muscle tears or, you know, you don't have that tired look to the physique that a lot of guys already have by that age. 
So it, right. is, is that kind of a struggle for you that you still definitely have what uh, Cutler always says, gas in the tank? Yeah, you know, I, it's a double-edged sword, you know. I, I know that I can keep going, you know. There's other shows that I could do, but when I really look at the list, there isn't anything that really interests me, you know. I'm not really too excited. You know, I wouldn't mind going to Asia and competing at the Arnold in Asia or maybe Brazil or whatnot, but, you know, in reality, like these shows right here, you know, and for me to end without injuries, uh, healthy, uh, still looking good and not all beat up and, and trying to, re, you know, hold on to something that just ain't there, you know, I, and, and plus, we all know bodybuilding doesn't really pay the bills, you know, like I, I've made a, a wonderful career out of it, but it has nothing to do with actually stepping on stage. It's what I parlay, you know, after these shows. And even still, you know, I, I think I, I've engraved my name in the bodybuilding enough where I don't really have to get on stage for people to, to understand what I do and, and, and who I am. So, you know, I'm really doing this because I'm still enjoying this. I know I, 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 I look good for my age and I'd like to end, you know, with a good memory in my head. Right on. So I guess the last question for you, this might be it or this or next season at the latest for you in this classic division, but it's it's definitely going to be, it's already, to me, I'm, I'm shocked at how fast it's growing in terms of last year there weren't any real names people were talking about. Now you already have, you know, you got you, you got Danny, you got uh, Arash, uh, Breon. It, it's got names already. It's got a fan base. When we cover these shows for MD, you know, the, the two things people want to follow the most, I should say three, is open, 212, and classic, classic physique. Mm. Because, like I said, it is bodybuilding, and bodybuilding fans are taking to it. So where do you see the division going in the next few years? Where, where would you like to see it go? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, with the, since the inception of the men's physique, that's helped the industry as a whole. Um, I think the, you know, the 212 class, you know, with no disrespect, disrespect to my, and my homies that are in that division or even in the, the federation, it's just, uh, it's becoming a niche division because those guys are just phenomenal. Like, you know, guys like, uh, Flex Lewis and a lot of these new guys are really short and just like built like tanks. It's just, that's not normal. You know what I mean? That's the genetic potential pushed to the max along with, you know, hard work. So, you know, it's becoming the opposite of, of the open where it's just these big mass monsters with the 212 it's like you know little guys are just monsters you know so the classic division you know most people can still you know the average person can look in that and they go ah it's still pleasing to the eye a lot of these guys still say that, that it's more attainable maybe they want to give it a shot so i really see this this um particular division shooting you know to the top because even for the men's physique guys you're really limited you know you get you work in your upper body you get just jacked as possible, ripped as possible in that upper body, but then you just stand there with your arms flared and there's no really challenge, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, with no disrespect, but there's no challenge. So when you become, you know, enter a bodybuilding division, you know, you can't just hide behind two poses, man. You're, you're exposed in every pose. So uh, that's why I think stuff like this is more of a challenge for, for smaller guys or even the bigger guys that want to save, the, save their physique like I did and want to come down or even the, the person that's never done anything Classic physique is, is something that, you know, looks fun, it looks cool, and uh, um, it, it's obtainable. Do you think eventually it's going to have all the poses and it's going to have more of a regular posing trunks? Yeah, I think that, like, the two things you just noted on are pretty important changes that should be implemented into the classic. So you got to remember, you know, classic physique and bodybuilding essentially are the same thing in way, what you, the way you get ready for them, but... You know, for classic, it, since it's supposed to be aimed more towards the aesthetics and the posing, you know, we're missing three or four poses that they're taken out of. So I think those need to be implemented back into it because especially if they're going to score more on the posing, then you got to see more angles and, and more of the poses. Uh, and then the, the trunks, you know, uh, you know, I, need, and I, I know they needed to start somewhere, but they eventually need to go, you know, into a, a shorter brief, whether that's like the old uh, Franco Arnold briefs or we just go right in the, into uh, regular posing trunks and you know we just kind of like make sure that we're all on the same page with what classic what aesthetics what symmetry really is right all right well i mean if you have these weight limits then theoretically it's it's it has to stay that way and if some guys just happen to meet the weight limits and don't have the nice pretty shape and everything they're just not going to do well anyway they'll get weeded out so yeah. you know, like we say the cream always rises to the top the best, yes. the guys with the best genetics and the guys with the best work ethic, they're gonna they're gonna dominate regardless of whether it's right. bike, bike shorts or Arnold Franco trunk. Absolutely. Uh, so, cool. Uh, so this is uh, this is five days out. I want to wish you the best of luck, Chicago Pro. 
Stan will be up there, hopefully winning Classic Physique Division. I uh, want to say it's been cool to watch you have this longevity in the sport, you know, whereas a lot of the guys we knew back in the late 90s, they're long gone. I don't even know what happened to most of them, to be yeah, honest man. with you. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're still here. You're still looking great. You're still, you know, killing it on the business side of things, too. Wife, kids. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to have seen, happy to see you be where you are today, Stan. It's 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 always good to see the good guys succeed in life. You're definitely one of them. So, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, very blessed. Uh, you know, bodybuilding has been great to me, and uh, you know, it just happens so fast. And I, like I said, I can still remember sitting in a cubicle when you were sitting across, and you know, you, were, you and Robin Chang doing their thing. But like, it just felt like yesterday. You know, it was. Yeah, I still can't believe that I've been on that stage for 20 years, and and uh, you know, so blessed I haven't had any any issues or any injuries, and and still walking strong. So. You know, I think uh, you know guys like you and 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 magazine for helping support me throughout all these years. And you know, I'm gonna give it everything I have this year, and hopefully, I uh, leave a, a lasting legacy. Cool, man. Well, I, I hope to. Uh, if the Olympics your last show, I'll definitely be be there rooting you on. Good luck this weekend in Chicago. For the Ron Line Report, this has been me, Ron Harris, with Stan the Man McQuay. Check it out.